I would like to thank our top sponsors, Matthias Preu, Fergus Ryan, and Diego, for making this show possible. And welcome to the Cave of Apelles. Tonight, I am joined by a man who has studied Indo-European mythology for more than 30 years, especially focusing on cosmogony and creation myths. Through his YouTube channel, Craigenford, he explores who the Indo-Europeans were and how their myths could spread to cultures like ancient India or Norse Scandinavia, changing yet still retaining their core. My guest will delve into stories like the Cosmic Twins, defeating the dragon and the cattle raiding myth, and discuss how myths are best to be understood. Are they projections of the human psyche, the condensed ethos of a culture, or symbolic manifestations of natural history? More intriguing still, are they particular to Homo sapiens, or has there been an exchange of stories between human species? John White. Welcome Hello. to the Cable Palace. Thank you very much for inviting me here. You have a lot to answer for now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's quite an introduction, thank you. I think we should uh, start with a normal start. Who are you and what is your channel about? And okay, well you did a good introduction, yeah. but uh, I am uh, John F. White and I am best known for teaching mythography, ethnography and religious history on a channel called Crackenford which is a, an Anglo-Saxon town from where I was born. Mm. Its name has changed. And I decided to start this channel during the pandemic. Uh, I was working at a university at the time and we weren't giving students direct one-on-one -on -one teaching. It was all remote learning or blended learning. And I thought this is a great opportunity for me to provide a sort of an, an unbounded education to, to them. And so, yes. And it's turned out quite a success, far better than I could ever imagined. So Absolutely. I'm very, yeah. very privileged. Yeah. Right. And it's uh, and I got to know about your uh, video through uh, Sturla Elingvold, yes. who's been on this channel, and we'll have some conversations with him as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic that you make these videos with s so much information. It's really well researched, mm -hmm. and that it's it has gotten so popular. You hear this idea that you have to to entertain and be funny and do all kinds of mm. weird things yes. to, to be popular. There's no gimmicks. There's absolutely, yeah. it's a, it is about learning and, and yeah. trying to make someone who doesn't understand the the intricacies of mythology to, to let them know there's some really interesting secrets behind how we know myths are what they are and where they come from and why they change. And it, I think it gives people an understanding of perhaps how we were like in the past. It's sort of touching on, oh, yeah, I didn't know that about people or why we sacrifice things or mm. how we thought the world came to be. And I think people are genuinely really interested in that. And especially if it relates to their own culture or their own heritage, yeah. very much so. Yeah, and you're, you're skilled because you deal with the whole Indo-European background of putting different mythologies in the context of that and showing exactly. some of the influence. Yes, yeah, so I'd much prefer to work on a broader scale than go deep. I, I can get an expert in if I want to go deep down a rabbit hole, but yeah. it, by having a stepping back and seeing a broader picture, I can place pieces together in some of the puzzles we have, some of the research we have that sometimes uh, experts may miss because they're too focused on a particular culture or a particular motif and not realizing there are other similarities. Mm, right. So maybe we should start with uh, what should be a natural question. What is a myth? That is a great question. So there's a, a few ways to answer this. Uh, the academic answer would be it's a, an ideological narrative for a better explanation is that it's religious history for atheists but uh, a more academic answer if you ever studied folklore and, and myth is that a myth is a story which has a sacred truth it, it 
has deities within it, gods within it, or godlike or demigodlike beings, or or heroes associated with gods, and it happens on a world that is very much like our own. Mm. You could mistake it for our own world, but it isn't our own world because we don't have gods and monsters roaming it. Uh, and it happens at a time in prehistory to the culture that has that myth. So, i.e. the records are orally transmitted to a point and then it is eventually written down. Mm. So that is the sort of the textbook definition of it. And this is why myths are important. So many people would say, I study myth. They think, oh, you mean fairy tales and stories and folklore. So they think, well, what value does that have? I mean, it's just a, a great story. But because it is sacred, that means there are people who thought it was religious and so therefore very important. And the way I express this that is uh, the people who believe in God, the Abrahamic God, they think the Bible is that is real, that, that tells them stories. They may not believe all the stories are true in it, but there'll be some stories in there they consider sacred. Mm. But as a mythologist, I look at that and say that is all myth. Mm. Or, or, well, it's myth and legend within the Bible. But yes, so that's how we look at it. We have to treat those stories with respect because we know people are treat them as, as sacred stories um, but that is why they are important because being sacred it means that people have treated those stories with respect and those stories haven't necessarily changed significantly throughout their lifetime and that allows us then to understand if we see the same story told in different places to start the process of understanding how we can link mm. these myths together if they are the same did they come from the same source and that way we can understand people's earlier beliefs that perhaps wouldn't otherwise be available to us. Yeah, yeah. And then there's that, so uh, sort of circling into what the, in European culture or, or a mm. set of beliefs were, but, but uh, um, I guess as you touched upon here in so-called modern times, we have this idea of myth just being something that is not true, just made up. Mm -hmm. So that's why it sort of has derogatory uh, minimal uh, connotation yes yeah. right right it's just uh, fantasy it's just yeah it, you <laughs> cannot trust it but it's kind of strange because i tend to say of course slightly polemically that if it is a myth then it means that it is true because okay. it does has it must have some kind of content to it that makes people take care of it and yes for it to last Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, either natural, in terms of describing nat natural history or psychology or some kind of value, there must be some kind of... Yes, yes, there, there are purposes to yeah. myth. myth. Myth definitely had purpose and, and we see different types of myth addressing different purposes. Mm. So uh, there, there's some common myths out there. So the, there's creation myths. So how did the world come to be? How did people arrive on the world? When you're on the world, you're then there are bad things happening, so how do you tackle these bad things? Often shaped in the form of dragons or other such monsters. Mm. Uh, then there's myths about floods we see, myths about, uh, and they miss what happens when you die, um, as, as well as other sort of more interesting and more folktale type myths, I would say, myths that are localised yes. rather than, than um, that have spread. And they're harder to tell because localised myths tend to turn into folklore because we don't have the evidence to maybe recreate them or to, to say that that is necessarily sacred unless the content has remained sacred within it. But you do see folklore change to become sacred. And that's, yeah. and that's particularly an example in uh, places like Eastern Europe where uh, it was Christianised um, quite late on and so the folklore was really embedded or myth was really embedded and the Christianization of it, certainly from more orthodox perspective, rewrote the current folklore and threw God or Jesus into that folklore, replacing whatever deity would have been there. Mm. So that, that way you can tell, oh, well, that probably was a myth and it's now become folklore because we know it's been corrupted by another religion later on, another culture. Yeah. yeah. And then you have that uh, that distinction about being able to see whether something is a myth or not. I mean, there's something I you talked about it, I think, in your videos, and there's something I remember a um, 
when I was living in Iceland, I met a, a man from the Czech Republic, Jerzy Stari, and he was then working on his PhD, talk, uh, looking into the similarities between Greek and Norse mythology. Mm -hmm. And I remember I learned that point from him uh, that the people who live in that culture, to them it's not myth. It is Absolutely. part of their everyday worldview somehow. Or uh, Yeah, so it really depends. So what people sometimes forget is that our world is very different to previous worlds and, and the world of... Greece in 2500 is different to the world of Greece in the year 2000 or, or 2000 years ago and is different to Greece 1500 years ago and the understanding of what myth and even logos was so the word and myth uh, has very much changed we see it change from what it means in Greece to when Rome started having an empire it changed again to change to how we see it today hmm. um, so so yes but certainly there was a time when those cultures saw what we think of as myth today as very important and, and, and necessary to help them understand life, understand you know, what we're doing here. Mm. Yeah, because you talked about that the difference between uh, living in it and believing in it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so if, you're, if, you're, if you're living the myth, that, so this is all about what is religion or how do you deal with those concepts. So, ritual. Um, comes from, or, or well, ritual can beget myth, but also myth can, in some instances can beget ritual. And so we see this process, if you're living in it, you tend to perform the myth as though it's a story. And we, and we see that plenty of times from the old Norse myths. Uh, people may not realise they, they, things like the Grimness Mall was, was performed. It was a performance. It wasn't just a story. There's, you know, and so people watched that. So you had that kind of um, understanding, but then you see things such as, what's a good example, uh, such as, let's say, the kettle or, or clan the dragon myth, where people would act out that or, or sacrifice an animal mm -hmm. because that's part of the story. And that's, and that's the whole point of sacrifice, um, where I can talk about the Indo-European cosmogony, if you want, and explain why sacrifice is important, because that's all linked together. So the cosmogony it goes something like this and we need to understand the creation myth of the Indo-Europeans first so I can give you a synopsis of that if that's right. okay so there's, there's quite a lot to, to digest here so we, have, we, we can reconstruct the Indo-European creation myth by taking a number of these creation myths in the Indo-European cultures seeing all the similarities and pull them together and say Oh yeah, they all, these are all similar, so this is probably what the myth contained. And David Anthony in his book, The Horse to Will and Language, actually does a very good uh, example of that. I think it's in chapter 8. Um, but it isn't, I don't think it's perfectly right, but we can talk about that later. But the, the myth basically goes that in the beginning, two primordial beings came to be. One was Manu, meaning man, and one was Yimo, meaning twin. So man is twin. Uh, and with them was a giant cow. And they floated around the cosmos, and some gods were created as they floated around the cosmos, but they eventually required a home. And so Manu said to Yimo, I, I shall sacrifice you to make our home, and Yimo agreed, he, he wanted to be sacrificed. And so with Yimo's body parts, Manu built the world. And we see this, um, process time and time again in, in many mythologies where bones are used for rock and blood is used for the sea hair is grass your brain could be the clouds the eye like with the emir in the in the Ed, exactly exactly in that the beguiling of gilfi talks about that in, in the prose mm -hmm. uh, so so we see this and, and the world is created and then manu comes down to the world and creates man uh, and what he does is he takes the head of some parts of the head of Yimo, and from that he creates a priest. He takes the torso of Yimo, and with parts of that he creates warriors, and the legs of Yimo he creates the providers, the farmers, the commoners. And so we see all these, but then he gets pieces of each body part of Yimo, and from that recreates the king. Right. And so the king has a piece of everyone in them, so he should understand everyone. But also the king is connected with the land. 
because the land is made exactly from the part, same parts as the king. So you have this process where you are part of the cosmos and the cosmos is part of you. So it's completely uh, sort of holistic. It's completely, exactly. exactly. And so this is where sacrifice starts coming in. So what happens is the, the cow, why is there a cow turning up? We often hear, certainly I hear Nordic scholars think, why is there a cow in the creation myth? Well, the Indo-Europeans, they were pastoral farmers. So they didn't focus on agriculture, they focused on cattle because cattle gave them everything they wanted. The hide could be used for clothes, the bones for tools, you could eat the flesh, the urine is a disinfectant, the dung a fertiliser. Every part of a cow, in fact even it's even it's the milk it gives to its babies, it's all mm. absolutely useful, 100% useful. That can't have just turned up, luckily a god must have created something so useful. That is why the cow was seen as the most important thing and it eventually becomes sacred in uh, Indian religion, and you see in Hinduism, that's why the cow is there. And so what happens we see in the Indo-European space is that because the cow is then, in many myths, is used to create other animals, what we see is that as part of a sacrificial routine, a cow is chopped up and its bits are given to the most important people in the community and, the, and so on. And so it's like a ranking system. Um, and so that, that's fed out and then so the cow is given to people and but the cow is also killed and so because the cow's killed part of its body goes back to the cosmos mm. but you also at the same time have given parts of the cow to the most important people like the, like the priests the warriors and the commoners and so in effect sacrifice is not only completing the cosmic cycle it's also a ritual act of recreating the creation myth mm. of the indo-europeans that's fascinating. That, that's why you talk about in one of your videos this, uh, uh, I guess, more as an advice than criticism that people who are so-called practicing heathenry misunderstand. Well, you, you can explain the just as a little yes, bit. Yes, I, I don't think many people who, who practice heathenry really understand the form of sacrifice and what it really means. It isn't, some people just say, here's a bit of meat for the gods. Yeah. Or, or a piece of bread or however they wish to perform a sacrifice. Now, obviously, I don't want people to go out and kill cattle or, or do human sacrifice because equivalents were done with humans too many many years ago we have evidence of that or, or implied evidence hmm. um, but what we really the the sacrifice should be about giving back to the cosmos not to the gods you don't in most hmm. indo-european religions you don't worship the gods as such you don't it's not like an abrahamic god where you have to go to church every sunday and say you know, thank you for being so kind and surprised and everything. You know, God, gods were there as a, to me, as a, well, originally they weren't even figurative, they were spirits, so you didn't even think of them as a person to, to, to look up to, but they were, they were just an energy, I, I guess, there interacting with the world to allow you to, you know, to, to allow the plants to grow, the rain to come, the sun to shine. And slowly they became uh, euhemorized, I guess, turned into real people. Uh, but even then, the old, I don't believe the Old Norse, for example, would have worshipped Odin specifically, you know, like we worship Jesus or, or God. Um, it was just, he was there to back you up, you know, providing you sacrifice to him. But he, he himself, I think there's, I can't remember where this line is, he, he says, do not give too much to me, for you, you, know, you may not be able to afford what you know, you, I can mm. give you, and, and do not sacrifice too much because you you may get more than you ask for. <laughs> so there yeah. it, really is a balance. It's all about balance, and, and that's what I love about the Indo-European culture is that this we're all one. Everything's one. It's, it's mm. almost animistic in a way. You know, really, it's still attached to nature, but you know, what you take, you must give back. Right. So, so on that note, can you say a little bit more about specifically the European sort of cultural history, historical facts, uh, where they were when? Okay, so who were the Indo-Europeans? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yes, because some people might get upset with the term Indo-European. So, basically, there are languages around Europe, through Persia and into India, that seem all to be related, and using good linguistic 
knowledge, we can show how those language ev languages evolved from a single source. And if we trace that source back, that original language we call Proto-Indo-European. And anybody who speaks a language that is derived from that, we refer to as an Indo-European. Mm. So it's, it's, it's got nothing really to do with their DNA or uh, who, who they worship directly. It's all to do with the language they speak. But what you will find is that because people spoke the same language, they often shared culture and DNA. So you, you do have this. And that helps us as mythologists trace myths and to identify how they dispersed. Now, the Proto-Indo-European language, it, as I say, is hypothetical because we have no record of anyone speaking it. So we often get pushback saying, yeah, but that's a hypothetical language. You can't prove it ever existed. But that's a, you know, a bit like saying, you know, seeing someone, a hole punched in a wall and not seeing a person punch a hole in the wall and saying, <laughs> yeah, well, how do you know someone punched a hole in the wall? But there's, there's, you know, there's enough well, evidence. Like, how do you know there. your bike is stolen? It's gone. Yeah, it's, it's got, exactly. Yeah. There, there, gone? We have uh, you know, significant confidence that there was a language called Proto-Indo-European. One of the questions, though, is where did it start? Um, and recent studies have provided more evidence to suggest it's probably nearer 8,000 years old than 6,000 years old, 6, years old, which is till a couple of years ago, a number of academics were pushing for. Um, it, but it had to be older than that because, you, because of the dispersals we're seeing and, and the way myths um, coming out. And that was probably from around either northern Anatolia or to around the Black Sea, the, the Caucasus Mountains uh, around there. But you know, it, 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 where it happens is a sense of only national pride to whoever where it comes from. So I, and I often say it's a language because it's a language. There were, you know, you had people who weren't DNA related to you who probably spoke Proto Indo European, yeah. and people who spoke Proto Indo European, um, yeah, without Proto Indo or Indo European DNA, if yeah. you wanted to say they were. So it's the same thing as with the, with the term Aryan, which is became yeah. politicized but was just a culture. In, yeah, Indo-Iranian culture is how that right. tends to be, because people want to associate it with Europe, but it really is more Indo-Iranian. Yeah, right. um, hmm. So so yes, yeah, so it's got nothing to do with countries or borders or nationalism. It's a language which can flow. You get Dutch people speaking French and Belgian people speaking French and a bit of German. It's, it's like that. There's no, the boundary is soft. You will never find out where it exactly started because hmm. it's a soft thing. Hmm. Um, so, but certainly it seems to have influence from uh, hunter-gatherer societies, uh, more from north of the Black Sea, and almost certainly some input from Anatolia, so Turkey, as, as well as input from Neolithic farming uh, communities who were migrating into that area at that time from the Near East, right. which brings a whole other layer of mythology to disrupt what the hunter-gatherers and the people ready in that area we're already talking about. Yeah. And so we start seeing two strands of myth. You know, we see Neolithic farming myth, we see Indo-European myth, and, and if you're Greek, you get thrown in a whole load of Near Eastern myth too. Uh, so it can be quite a complex, almost like an archeological dig to sift through all mm. the different myths to try and work out where each myth came from and, and where it was influenced from. So uh, yeah, mm. so I hope that explains that. So Indo-European is a language, and so anybody who speaks a, we call Indo-European, speaks a language that has derived from what we consider to be Proto-Indo-European. So it's north, northeast of the Black Sea? The, around the Black Sea, yeah. yeah. Think of the Black Sea, Caucasus right. Mountains region around there. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then, um, uh, okay, so, so maybe then, before we go to these so the main mythologies, mm -hmm. main motifs of the Indo-European or derived yeah, uh, mythology. We'll talk about some of the myths, yeah. Yeah. Um, what l l what kind of tools do you use when you find oh. these connections? How like, do you like study myths. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, so we well, th there's a number of methods, but phylogenetics tends to be the key one. It's uh, it's, it's used a lot more than it used to be, and it's based on the fact that people or academics believe myths act a little like DNA in terms of, you know, DNA is pretty strong and, and you see traces of it through generations, but occasionally it changes and 
things are dropped and and they're like and that just feels like myth so uh, basically around phylogenetics there's a probabilistic model lots of statistics so we gather data such as uh, let's say we wanted to see if uh, a myth of dragon slaying in India is related to the myth of dragon slaying in uh, Norway so uh, Thor and the Jormungandr versus Indra and Vitra and what we do is we can we, we see where did the languages come from because we use linguistic evolution did, did it travel from India to Norway did it travel from Norway to India or did they seem to come from a source in the middle mm. we also look at DNA to see how DNA changed did, did uh, the Vedic culture from India travel to Norway or the Norwegians travel to India or was a another dispersal that went out uh, and then we actually look at the myth itself and see how it changes and if we track traces of these myths all along the path of the dispersal route we can see what is consistent and what changes and if things change in a what looks like a sensible way we can then there's more probability that it a myth traveled in one direction than another and we build these big spider web type models of all the possibilities and probabilities and say what's more likely and some things are just you know we know people didn't travel from india to norway to spread the myths and, and vice versa uh, and we see there's a central point but yeah we, we work out the probability uh, using that which really means that nothing i'm telling you today is certain mm. it's just a the prob the most probable outcome based on the knowledge we have and people do argue well you know, can't you improve your models and things like that but you know, these are complex models and if there's a new genetic study come out with 10,000 results you put 10,000 results in a, a system that's already got you know, 100,000 things in it and it, yeah, it becomes complicated and expensive and there's a lot of manual labour but I'm hoping with time we can simplify that with the, the use of AI tools now AI is coming in we can use that to help manage data more efficiently and we may you know, be able to do things almost um, in real time mm. do analysis in real time that would be my plan i'd love to be able to help deliver systems like that but then you will you see changes that are not too great to be able to see if a myth travels from point to point yes yeah, so if, if there's there some kind of not, not necessarily just reduces the probability so if you see humans have dispersed from let's say uh the Black Sea to uh, Greece, for example, and, and the myth hasn't changed, but you see the language also evolved from the Black Sea to Greece, then you have two lines of probabilistic calls that if the myths have stayed the same, then it's probably a very strong myth mm. and very key. And so you do find that there are often some very key points in myths that always remain the same, which gives us some confidence. So for example, the Indo-European creation myth I told you about with Manu and Jimo, if you look at the creation myths in the Purusa hymn of the Rig Veda, it has Manu in there, uh, Vah Purusa, uh, and it talks of Yima, Cognat and, and Yama in Persia. Uh, we also have uh, Gayamart in Zoroastrianism, which uh, has been shown to be cognate to uh, Yimo. Uh, we have uh, Gemini uh, and Gemini in Greek, and, and again, that will go to probably Gaelic and Irish, linked to twin, Emir which is the Old Norse pronunciation of the primordial god in the Old Norse, linked to Twin, Twisco in Tacitus' Germania, he saw in Teutons, and his, his Manus as well in, in his stories. You can't, this isn't, this isn't an archetypal thought that everybody thought of as, you know, as part of growing up. It is the same story with the same people yeah. in it across that landscape. similar names. But it's, yeah, absolutely cognate names. That, that isn't... So you, you just look for uh, uh, look for what names or what words reoccur, what lines, plot points, names of animals or dragons uh, or things that happen that are, yeah. are critical. What uh, kind of characters that reoccur? <laughs> yeah, yeah, things, things like that. Yeah, names names are slightly more unusual, but there are, there are some yeah there are some links to cognates in, in some of those myths. Uh, but yeah, we just find key points like like uh, for example, uh, I'll touch on this briefly now. Dragon raiding myths, like killing dragons, is a common story. Less common is killing dragons and taking cattle, because because a dragon took your cattle, you steal it back. But less common still is having the warrior who does it called Trito, hmm. and Trito means third in Proto-Indo-European. Yeah. So we have the story of Manu, the first man, his twin, 
Yimo and Trito, one, two, three, like as, as proto Indo European characters. And, and you see Miss with uh, Trita in India and Ther, uh, Theret Tona uh, in uh, Persia, uh, as well as hints of it in Germany of this, this third warrior killing a dragon and stealing cattle. And so, yeah, th these links are absolutely there. Right, right. And, and then what kind of um, later mythologies were, or can be called Indo-European then? Where did this myth spread? What kind of... Well, how can you tell what's Indo-European? Yeah, yeah, like in what, with, right. which mythologies are we talking about? So the cattle raiding myth with Trito is Indo-European mythology because Trito is an Indo-European name and we see that. So we see that, say, said in India, Persia, and into Germany as examples. But we also see cattle raiding occur uh, without Trito in other myths. So the cattle raiding myth basically goes after Manu has come to the world and upset it in order. He teaches, to, or teaches the people how to keep this world in order through ritual sacrifice. Um, and because the cow's important, the thought process we have is that Indo-Europeans, when they saw another culture with cattle, they must have stolen that, those cattle because those cattle were made for them because their gods made the cattle because they're perfect. So let's have a raid and take the cattle back. And so the, the dragon, the monster, is, is normally a representation of the gods that those people worship. So you often get it considered like a, a three-headed god, and we think that because of the name of Trito, well, Trito means third, but it seems to relate to the monster that they're, they're, they're killing, um, but that monster has obviously taken their cattle first. So it isn't like they're just going out and killing people. That monster has their cattle, and they must have taken the cattle, so we have the right to kill them um, and bring the cattle back so and that was all part of a ritual process and we see uh, writings that say uh, young warriors were taken into a cave to fight a sort of a, a, a dragon as part of the process of becoming a man and that's probably was just a well I don't know maybe someone's dressed up or a, a model of a beast or something but that was part of the the process which must be quite scary for a young man if you don't know where you're going into a cave and you know, you're killing this beast uh, but yeah so that's that's all parts getting the cattle so they can be sacrificed and more cattle come uh, in in the process so um so yeah so Trito's the sort of we know that's indo-european um but as i say there are uh, other myths we got we and linked to that are, are things like uh, in Germany, while we don't have the myth, we have a art artifact called the Horn of Gallius. There's a pair of them, I think they're called, and uh, they're, they're, they're gold. They were originally gold horns with lots of iconography on them. Mm. Uh, and on there, and I think this is Bruce Lincoln who, who noted this, that there was a three-headed monster on there with a weapon and, and animals led to it, and he felt that was a um, sort of a, an iconographic uh, 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 well, a diagrammatic approach to um, the myth. So even ha even though we haven't got a, a an oral example or a written example, there's a view there that there's a Trito type thing happening, um, and, and Trito is quite a common cognate. Uh, other Indo-European myths that no, they're Indo-European. Say we, we talked about the creation myth, um, and, and the dragon fighting myths where it's getting cows we see outside the Indo-European space. So we don't know if they've been influenced from Indo-Europeans or not. So we see them in, even in the Bible, I think it's David and the Philistines. There's a story about um, a warrior getting cattle back. Uh, uh, Hercules, uh, Hercules and uh, Gurion is another one. You see him getting cattle after killing a monster. So, and, and the bull of uh, Kulani from Queen uh, Mev, which is like the Tain. There's a book called The Tain about the cattle raiding myth of Ireland. And that, again, that's Indo-European at its heart because it talks about, well, at the end, the cattle are killed and create the landscape of Ireland. Mm. Um, so, so they're definitely Indo-European. The flood myth isn't Indo-European. If we talk about the flood myth, that's a, whilst there are flood myths within Indo-European 
um, mythology they, they didn't wasn't sourced from there uh, so basically we use a process of elimination where if the myths being told outside the Indo-European landscape uh, and I say reasonably consistently so so we see the Catarady myth for example in Africa then we have to make our best guess that it may not have originated in in the European space but is a more general story people like killing monsters yeah, that's a story of a hero mm. and so yeah, that monster takes the shape of a snake or a dragon which isn't unusual uh, but we'll talk about that when we talk about dragons and why <laughs> that is um, I don't know if I answered your question there uh, about what is and isn't. Well, it's, it, this whole is such a grand field. Like, where do you even well, it's start? Well, probability. Like, so, so yeah. you use the probability yeah. maps as well. But yeah, 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 yeah. There, there are other myths within it. So we have myths of the uh, so so the twins of creation shouldn't be confused with the divine twins. The, you know, so we see uh, Castor and Pollux in, in Rome, or Hengist and Horsa. Uh, in in Germanic myths, they're, they're legends. Like, or well, they they seem to be legends, but actually myths because we see them dotted around in different places. They, you know, they can't be legends if every culture in Indo-European seems to have a divine twin. That's mm. you know that that's got to be a story. And what we find with that divine twin is quite the divine twin is quite interesting. Was, this was first found when really studying the Indian uh, myth, and we see that. In these myths, one twin seems to be different to the other in terms of ability. And we find that uh, the stronger twin is more warrior-like and the weaker twin is more a commoner. So if you look at this priest, warrior, commoner, I mean, there seems to be one seems to have done well and one not. And that's because as you go through history, you'll see these stories drop the commoner twin and only the the warrior twin survives. So in Hengist and Horsa, for example, we, we see this in Anglo-Saxon texts, Hengist and Horsa come to England, into Kent, and, and battle the Britons, uh, and then uh, you eventually see Horsa disappear, and then it's just Hengist and his child Esk who carry on battling, hmm. and that's not uncommon. And uh, so, and we see that with Castor and Pollux. Castor, I believe, uh, remains, becomes a like a patron saint of the centurions, or some of the centurions, and Pollux disappears. So these myths show then the the uh, values of the culture. You like that, how that, that, evolves. that 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 yes shows that there's. So perhaps one of the other things we could talk about is you know what can else can we tell from the cosmogony the that and, and we can recreate some poetry and that's been done and one of the most famous lines we know within. Uh, the Indo-European studies is the line fame does not decay mm. and that's a line that suggests that the better you do in life the, the more of a hero you are or the more good you do for society the more people know you you won't be forgotten and that's because whilst they didn't believe in true immortality of the body they believed that if poems were written about you because everybody heard poems written about their heroes then your name would be continue to be remembered because those poems written about you would be sang by many generations mm. to come and i think so then you can find remnants of that for example in in uh, one of the virtues uh, of a viking would be to be able to write poetry in the viking yes or it, norse culture well it was, yeah it was an important yeah. thing i'd yeah. say yes it's a uh, the, the history of writing is quite interesting. It's uh, because it, orig it was originally seen as esoteric uh, because the only people who really understood it were the priests and they knew all the stories because they could read them and they knew the knowledge because they could read it. So there was sort of some magic associated with it and we see that in the runes. You know, there are many rune, there's a few rune poems and where Odin's on the Yggdrasil self-sacrificing, reaching down, he discovers the runes and the magic yeah. of the runes. So there's that. Um, but what is interesting with that, and actually can link back to the Indo-European cattle raiding myths with Trita, is there's a common theme there, and that is of a drink. So there's a drink, the mead of poetry, some people may be familiar with. There's a drink called Soma and, and variations of it. So we see the myth of the dragon raid and Trita, um, 
to start developing. So Trita uh, eventually drinks Soma before he goes on the raid, and that's a sacrifice. People think that's a bit of an odd sacrifice, <laughs> but what tends to happen, there's different methods of this. Um, one is the Soma's drank, and then if the warrior then has uh, intercourse with his wife and the wife has children, the children then bear the the, the courage, and we so we see Treta sort of turn into the son of Treta in certain myths. But in other myths, it also calls the god to to help in the fight, and we believe that's how Treta versus Ahi in the Vedic myths turned into Indra versus Vitra. It, not not a change overnight, but we believe Treta probably called Indra as his helping god, and then through what we. Called, called poetic simplification, which is sort of an easy way to say things are forgotten, or, or well, it's easier to remember a particular line of poetry than another. Mm. Um, yeah, teacher, teacher, the old teacher disappears, and uh, Indra becomes the god who fights the dra dragon. Right, but that is, I mean, you have an interesting video on the uh, fighting the dragon, yes. and how that evolves. Where oh, the, the, yeah, that's it. So that's, so, do you want to go back to the very beginning of dragon myths? Yes. Yeah, so, okay, so we're going further back than Indo-European culture here. We're going tens of thousands of years back. Uh, and this is work based by De Hoy, um, who's someone I admire greatly, who, who really pushed the use of phylogenetics to understand you know, how myths dispersed. So, we first see, so, or we believe dragon stories first started to appear in Africa, southern Africa. So, and this would have been over 70,000 years ago because it's before we dispersed from, from Africa. And the story there was of, uh, I think it was called the rain snake, if I remember rightly. Uh, and it's, it's all to do with water. And there's still some imagery we see in caves there that has a serpent in water, but also some sometimes quadrupeds in water, and we don't know what they are. Um, and people having nosebleeds. But when you listen to the story, so this was, I think it was in the late 19th century, some explorer was there with a guide and he was telling them what these paintings meant. He wrote down this story. And the story was, was that this serpent came down and gave water to the world and made the world grow and be fertile. But but you also had to be careful of that being because it's, it's, it's a dangerous snake. And we think that perhaps being bitten by a snake causes nosebleeds, which, which is why we see this link. Anyway, this snake or quadruped or whatever it was, we, we see change shape from a, into a, a chimera type being like a lion and, and with wings and, and all sorts uh, until we get to um, China. But what's also interesting is we see some dispersal down into Australia where the snake, where they have the rainbow serpent, which is very similar. It, it, the, the land is dry in their creation myth. The rainbow serpent comes, it rains, things grow, people come up from the earth uh, and people then do something bad and the rainbow serpent says, you do that again, I'll eat you or whatever. So, and, and man lives happily in the, Australia. Uh, but when it gets to China, it's still quite similar, uh, and the story goes that the dragons again provide water to to make the world fertile. But this upsets the the emperor or, or the ruler, and he gets the dragons buried under the mountains, and they become the sources of the major rivers of China. But then something interesting happens, and that is agriculture comes along, farming comes along, about twelve thousand years ago, and. This dragon who was helping them grow crops suddenly isn't giving them water. Why is that? And what we find is that the dragon myth then changes that the gods have to go up and beat the dragon up to get water. And so we see stories of things like Indra versus Vitra, the dragon myth, where Indra goes in the clouds and he's smashing the dragon and then there's lightning and thunder and that noise is the gods fighting the dragon, and when the dragon is defeated, it lets go of its water. Mm. Rain comes. So it becomes an antagonistic relationship. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So rather than dragon giving water, you have to force the dragon to <laughs> give you water. Yeah. But, but then, when it comes to 
Indo-European myth, they're not agricultural farmers, they're pastoral farmers. So what has a dragon done? It's stolen the cattle rather than not providing water. But what is very interesting with that myth is that in the Rig Veda, and this is a point perhaps I should have mentioned at the beginning, one of the other reasons why myth remains consistent is because it isn't in prose form, it's a poem. It's like, uh, all our old ancient texts tend to be poetry, mm. which means that people were telling these stories as poems because they're easier to remember, which makes perfect sense. And if they enact them, like you were saying too, it be, I mean, when today if you read Edda, you could be like, oh, this is just dry text. Yes. But it's different if it's being performed, it's being with dramatic lighting or whatever they Ex would exactly. wear on. Exactly, it just helps the, whole, the overall performance of, of that. <laughs> so um, we, we have kennings in Old Norse texts, but there are metaphors and the like. So sometimes two words don't rhyme, like um, killing the dragon doesn't rhyme with us getting lots of water. Mm -hmm. So you, you change things. So what happens is within the Rig Veda, when the cattle raiding Trito comes and, and uh, kills a dragon, when they write it down, rather than getting cattle back, uh, they write this metaphor that it gets women that um, give milk, mm. women that lactate, a term that does that. Unfortunately, for, well, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, when uh, the Persians came across the myth, that word, I think it's Dahenu, um, was very cognate to one of their words, which is, Women, yeah, and and then when they saw that, were they like women that lactate, and by women it didn't mean females that lactate. It's probably a better word. It was it was non-specific on the the creature lactating. It was it was there, yeah. but when it came to Persia, it's like oh, women. That must be women, and so dragons stopped getting cattle, and started getting women. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a misunderstanding. A misunderstanding. And then you see myths about dragons and women. Now, whether that's definitely related to that, I don't know. But it, it, the, the, I guess the, the way we see it evolve, it makes sense that then because the Greeks went into Persia quite a lot and t took a lot of their thoughts, that's where the myths of dragons stealing women mm. then start coming from. Mm. Um, but you also still have the... the, the um, hero kill, getting uh, cattle as well in Greece, as well as heroes just killing dragons and not getting cattle. But it's uh, interesting too because, I mean, it's not, uh, of course, uh, it's being politically incorrect, but it's not f far off for many men to want to save the princess and for the princess wanting to be saved. So, exactly, exactly, yes. So it's, was that just a lucky match or <laughs> was it? Um, I say that, that may, it may just been one of those lucky overlaps in, in yeah. folklore that you know it just makes sense oh yeah that makes sense you yeah. know otherwise they wouldn't have changed yeah. it to women in the first place if it didn't yeah. make sense so their story of cattle raiding in Persia turned out to be two queens mm. that were stolen they changed it to two queens and yeah so and that must have made sense but so that, that, are we then talking about this well I guess it's difficult but then you would almost talk about uh, if you had the material you would uh, almost talk about the specific year when it actually happened, but there was a new edition came out, but it was mistranslated or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you see, and you see that sometimes. It's uh, it's not it's not exclusive to that. There's probably other other examples. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. I'm sure there's been uh, ways. Well, in fact, there is one um, around Odin, but we're, I'm sure we're going to talk about that another time. Yeah. Um, but yes, we, yeah. Uh -huh. this, these things happen. Uh -huh. So you, you could argue sometimes it's better to listen to a story than read the text. Yes. <laughs> because of how you interpret it. And that's, yes. okay, that's, something, that's a very important point in understanding myths we haven't really touched on, which is that most myths, if you're doing Indo-European studies, aren't written in the language you're familiar with natively. And so you rely on interpretations. So where we have poetry, should the sort of well, do translation interpretation be literal? Um, in which case, we may get kennings that we don't understand, which maybe the old Norse did, um, such as seagulls of the battlefield, which are ravens. Mm -hmm. So, do you write down 
when you translate seagulls of the battlefield, yeah. or do you write down ravens, or do you try and maintain the poetic essence and create some alliterative equivalent? So, so that the, the proportion between the t two images would be the same it's, it's, in a different it's, culture. Exactly. So you have all this. So, yeah. so people like me have 12 different copies of the poetic edda. <laughs> Because everyone looking at a verse, want to see how people translated it, just to make sure mm. I sort of really understand him what that translation right. really should have been, yeah. and, and that's, that's very important. That's exactly why, because otherwise, a misinterpretation, you know, or mistranslation ends up in a an embarrassing situation where you've got all your cattle, but you've lost your women. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but then it's it's. Uh... Yeah, well, speaking of the, the um, Edda, uh, again, you've said it many times in your videos, you said it before we sat down here, and I can to this day not, I, I mix up Poetic Edda and Prose Edda all the time. One was written by Snorra, Snorra, mm -hmm. and then this the other one. Yes. So here we have the one that was not written by Snorra. Snorra. Yes. Um, uh, but how was that found? Are there stories there that that have been changed by the people who wrote them down? Do, okay. we, uh, so do we know things that were missing? Like, why did we end up with this? That's, a, that's a, a very good question. And again, when you, not only do you have to worry about translations and interpretations, you have to worry about the material that is being translated and yeah. interpreted. So we have source material, which was written by the culture that was telling the myths. We have secondary material that was written by someone who had access to that culture. Like Snorri, like Snorri, you could almost argue that it's a slightly okay. later, but and then yeah. you got well, third step removed, which you weren't related. You're just using your own knowledge and and research. So Snorri is more second, okay, uh, a degree. So that's why we have to be careful with the prose editor because Snorri didn't write the prose editor as a a reference to uh, Nordic mythology. He wrote it as a book about poetry and used Old Norse mythology as, as the premise for telling that. Mm. Um, but with, within the prose editor, there are stories that we're absolutely certain he made up mm. uh, for Christian conversion reasons. So... That intentionally intention changed them? No, or? intentionally wrote them. Yeah. So th there's a story about Thor and his three tasks, where he has yeah. to sort of drink the, the volume of a, a horn and it's the sea, yeah. where he can't lift up a cat because it... Yeah. Um, that we have no knowledge of that in in Norse anywhere. We, we do feel because it's showing a god failing, first time a god fails, that's Snorri writing a story to try and make us believe the gods are aren't as strong as you think they are. Uh huh. But isn't there? But but you do have. But on that note, you do have that story. Uh, that's from uh, the. Poetic Edda, mm -hmm. yeah. Poetic Edda. <laughs> uh, about uh, this where he wants to cross that river, and then uh, there's this man who's forces oh, 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 him, oh, yeah, and possibly, who makes yes. fun of him. So yes. it's not uncommon either that they no, uh, suddenly make mistakes or suddenly uh, are not good enough. Yeah, I mean Thor, Thor, Thor is, a, is is probably the comedian of the, the Nordic gods. No yeah. offense to Thor, if he's <laughs> up there, um, but but he, he does doesn't necessarily seem to be the most intellectually sound of, of them because some, you know, he, some of the things he does. Uh, but but the, that story of the fair man is quite interesting because that is, that is actually based on the story of the fair man of the dead, um, where because they talk, because the language used said it's an old man, you, know, you don't quite see him. And that's a real um, nod to how the fair man of the dead is described in multiple myths. Yeah. But before we, if we want to talk about that, before we get there, Going back to the source material, so, so we have to be cautious of where this information comes from, our sources. Uh, but the Poetic Edda is a primary source, we think, Al although it was written nice and after, you know, a couple of hundred years after the, the Viking Age had stopped, we, we feel confident because it is poetry and so less likely to be forged or altered, or if it is, we can tell. Uh -huh. If someone stops a poem rhyming or following the grammatic rules, then we say, ah, oh, something's gone on here. Yeah, and there are that's interesting. There are some examples in there where we don't think that's right, and some things haven't quite been the same. Um, but what also comes with that is that not only do we see those alterations, um, we also see that some pages of the original document are missing, which may hint that some people weren't happy 
with the content of that being left around for whatever yeah. reason. I mean, it was pure supposition. It, um, but I mean, why else? Unless those pages just lost or damaged or burnt, but otherwise, if you've got a whole manuscript there, why would you take out some pages? Right. And, and so th there may have been a poem there that helped, you know, may maybe considered sacrilege to Christians or something like that. Uh, who, who knows? And so you can get an idea of Norse mythology based on something that is insufficient. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so, and that's what, but, but uh, luckily, Snorri in the prose editor does hint at lines of verses for poems we haven't got as well. Yeah. So there may have been those poems. We, we will never, probably never know, although that'd be a real shame. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. So there is one version of the Poetic Edda, which is the version. That we, that based on the original manuscript yeah. that was that was literally copied when that yeah. when it was found yeah. um, and as, as a the yeah, calls a whole stir in in Europe when that was found because yeah. uh, that was shortly after uh, Pope Pius II who was uh, Piccolo Mini was his name as a researcher at the time came across Tacitus' uh, Germania document for the first time in a while so you imagine the Mediterranean culture, the, the, antique, like the antiquity was based on the Mediterranean cultures, suddenly you get these documents pop up suggesting that Germanic tribes and Nordic culture was far more advanced than the, the Christians were saying they were. They were saying you're all barbarians. Then that suddenly stirs a movement. But yeah. um, I think that's a story for another day rather than, <laughs> rather than here. Yeah, but there is also a... Um Reason why we have this image on the twins. wall, twins by Odd Nordrum, and uh, even though I watched a few of your videos, I still have a little bit of a, of a, of a problem understanding the difference between you have two sets of twins, twins. right? You have the sacred twins, or like what, how, you have, how is it? So you have um, the twins uh, of creation in, in the European mythology. In European, that's a big, yes, yeah, a big yeah, twin image, so, which is which is all what twins pop up so much. So it must. So people, when someone had twins, it must have meant something special to the yeah. culture. Although we have no particular records of that directly, we see that the the creation had twins in it, Manu and Yemo, and Yemo means twin um, in there. But we also see these divine twins, which you tend to have one. This is really odd. One is fathered by a god, and the other one isn't. Yeah. And the one fathered by the god, even though they're twins, is the one that survives, and the one that wasn't is the one that disappears in myth. But that's Mano and Yemo? No, no, that's not Mano and Yemo, because they're, they are primordial. You have to think, Mano and Yemo yeah. started it before the gods, they were primordial beings, um, and so Yemo is sacrificed and the world comes. What actually, what happens to Yemo is he then becomes the king of the underworld, the lord of the underworld. Um, and that's, mm. that's where he goes to, to rule yeah. that, which is quite a nice sort of tidy up of, of what happened to, to Yemo after he cut up his body, that way did <laughs> his, his presence. But yeah, he becomes lord of the underworld and we see uh, sort of mythologies around that as well. So Manu and Yemo are not the sacred twins, but they are, they are twins. Ma Manu and Yemo primordial twins of well, creation. Yeah. Uh, people like Hengiston also are divine twins. So one of them is yeah. fathered by God and the other yeah. isn't. And yeah. they live almost a legendary life rather than a, a, a sort of mythical life. Yeah, and I think uh, this is a book that you recommended in one of your videos, Comparative Mythology mm. by Jan Puver. Mm. And I guess he uses the term Dioscorism? Yeah, so that was a term, yeah. you, yes. Which is for those... For, for, for they, the, the divine twins. Yeah. So that, that was a, a term used more around Greece and Italy yeah. um, rather than Hengist and Horsa per se. Uh, but yes. But the essence is the same. But the essence is the same. They, yeah. they were seen there. And, uh, and, and yeah, so we, whilst we're lacking some of the detail of those myths we would like, we can certainly see from places like India, as I said, that there is this, you know, even in India where they look relatively the same, there is a difference and, and one drops out. And it's, why is that? Why is it, does it mean that one twin is always meant to be given everything and the other mm. doesn't? It may be related to, um, well, I'll say the, the view that it was a very, very male dominated society. So when the father died, the eldest son got everything and the youngest son didn't, or the younger son, and they had to find their own way. And that's how mm. um, eventually the Europeans ended up really in Europe, 
because all these men had to find new land and new wives. So they came and, and settled with the Neolithic farmers and the hunter-gatherers in Europe to, mm. to establish that, as well as giving the plague to all the Neolithic farmers and killing a significant majority of them because they were used to crops and not... Well, oh, that's what happened. You, you exchange values and uh, different yeah, yeah, different things. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's what the Spanish did in South America. Yeah, you you bring things with you, and they have unfortunate side effects. Yeah, but th there's one thing um, that I wanted to to hear if you could clarify. Uh, in one of the videos, because I do you do have several on the uh, the dragon uh, mm -hmm. uh, slaying, um, you talk about that the dragon motif is not an archetype if i understood you correctly well, so, so so how do you define an archetype there so we know well, okay. when to use that term <clears throat> so because we see the evolution of the myth we know that the 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 myth of the dragon and the water to the dragon you know, in agricultural terms and then the change into pastoral use of that dragon that seems probabilistically linked mm. um, and then where you see cattle raiding after that which you see from places in the Nile up through the Near East and into Indo-European still linked uh, you can say that's well th they are linked because they've got the cattle raid and then the ones that then have Trito and you can say are more concentrated on just Indo-European version so from that point of view uh, it's not an archetype because you see the story has grown and, and developed and, and become very specific in the European regions. Um, where you just talk about killing a monster, that is probably arch that's an archetype because it's we like killing a monster, but that monster could be anything. It, couldn't, it doesn't oh, have to be a dragon. Okay. But the, the, ba the basic idea is the same. Basic idea, right. because you're, you're, you're yeah. killing them. Every, there will be killing the monster. It's like wars of a big thing in myth. So you have the Asir and the Vanir, uh, uh, but you also see that in, in India and other cultures there. You see these two sets of gods or gods and demons sometimes battle. That seems to be a common theme. Yeah. And it's in that seems, I want to say archetypal, because I can't necessarily trace a route for that myth. So you can't see that being dispersed. But you see this myth coming up time and again. But but, it, but but if it is an archetype, wouldn't it be so that then that it could also arise separately? Because well, there is, I mean, and, and I, I want to hear what you think about this. As far as I've understood, and this is not speaking as a scholar, um, the uh, archetype or things have become archetypes because during the course of many many thousands of years. We have experienced threats or whatever in society, so it sort of gets ingrained in us. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. So that if we if we accept that, then when people, uh, well, you, you had this one video about uh, about um, um, trans dates, right, uh, or mm -hmm. using substances. Yes, yes. And this is sort of uh, has talked about that. If you then go get into that, what we call the subconscious area you could learn from things that are actually external to you because certain experiences are embedded in instinct, somehow. Instinct, like an instinct. Yeah, and yes. that would be an archetypal well, image. Uh, yes. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, as I say, the, yeah, so, so killing a monster is an archetypal thing, yeah. definitely. Yeah. But the killing a dragon to get cattle with your warrior called Trito, who drinks mm. a drink, That's and that... It's fairly spread. specific exactly. or more specific and, and killing a dragon and getting yeah. cattle yeah that's quite specific killing a dragon as far loose that you could almost consider that as killing a monster mm. type myth so you really have to that's where we look at the details of the myth and see what's happening are they getting a reward mm. for killing the monster did the monster attack them first mm. and then it was attacked because that suggests it's more a yeah, one type of myth than another type of myth. But yeah. so, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. killing the monster is archetypal, standard hero stuff. But some of the dragon mythologies definitely uh, has evolved and and. Yeah. Well. So. Okay. So, if you really zoom out, uh, when you're talking about uh, the European mythology or the the mythogems 
almost and mm -hmm. motifs of uh, in European culture. Yeah. And you find them, them in India, uh, uh, Iran, Germany, yeah, exactly, yeah. etc. What areas are definitely not in the European and just to really make it really clear? Okay, so unfortunately, if you say that today, most of the world is Indo-European because of the way we migrate, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, colonized areas. Yeah. So what we have to be very careful about is our sources, yeah. which you sort of touch on. So if we go to North America, for example, um, we can, and even in South America, we can see myths that seem very familiar to us. Yeah. And we have to try and understand, did that myth come here with the colonization, um, with uh, missionaries? Uh, although with the missionary comes along, you can all normally tell because it's a Christianized story, or did it come from another source? And so we have some far older myths we know about that we know aren't Indo-European, but have come from probably more like Siberia, so it's probably the source of some of them, but, but certainly near the Indo-European start place of the, uh, and, and spread. Um, but yeah, in Indo-European myths, yeah, we consider our myths just told between Europe, Persia, and into India, you know, sort of pre-1000 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but it does depend. It's a variable time frame because it depends when Christians came along and and corrupted many of those myths. So you know, it's all, the, the timeline changes depending on what's happened to the society when, for myths to be told. Yeah, but then what are... Um because this is something that that uh, I've been thinking about how the the uh, pantheon that you have, or if it's one god, necessarily influences your way, way of thinking, right? Okay. From the, I would presume. I mean, it's it would be perhaps a different culture if you have a uh, mythology or a religion where the gods are created. Mm -hmm. from a religion where God creates. Yes, very much different. Yes, that would, that. I presume, necessarily Cult influence your different. outlook on life, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. You see that. And you see cultures that don't even have gods. So if you go to North America, certainly the Inuit population, but certainly yeah, yeah. many tribes, <laughs> they don't have gods. Yeah. Yeah, they're still animistic. Yeah. And it seems, uh, yeah, and, and I'm... Uh, I have some brain damages. One is Moby Dick, and other is uh, Inuit uh, stories. Mm -hmm. And then you get that very strange sense that that things is, it's not a moral uh, view at all. No, it's just a, a st some things just feel like a story. Yeah, uh, not the big because they're not. There's no deities in it. No, is it sacred? So is the story the shape it was two thousand years ago or four thousand years ago? Yeah. Maybe not. We can't really tell. And that's that's a real problem. And that's the problem we have when people say. John, why don't you go and tell us these African stories? Because they must be the oldest. Yeah. And I'm like, show me the evidence. There yeah. is no, I'm not saying they aren't the oldest stories, but I can't, as an academic, say that story is 10,000 years old because there is no trail, no record of those stories yeah. being told. So th th there's nothing to go on. So we have big blank spaces over Africa and much of the Americas, certainly South America. We just, no idea yeah. um, because of that. Yeah, yeah. No, and it, it's it's very strange how, like there's, there's this little strange story, of, uh, Inuit story, about some boys bothering a fisherman and then he he uh, con conjures up some magic and, uh, and uh, shuts them up inside a mountain or something like that and they end up, I think, dying in there. And then at the other story, he turns into a star and that's it. Yeah, there's, there's so, that's what I'm <laughs> that might just explain the star. So one thing that's really puzzled me, we see in myth the, the landscape and society change. And so the myths seem very grounded on the earth. Yeah. But there's a whole night sky above us. And I get many archaeoastrologists, they call themselves, who look at the night sky and say, oh, this is where all our stories were. This is the Netflix of our ancestors. Why don't you know all these stories? And all the stories you tell actually aren't about what you're saying. They're about all these stars. Mm. And it's like, oh, that's, that's interesting. And that, those, so that's why I think things like those Inuit stories help 
suggest why certain stars are in the sky. And we do know of very old Inuit stories that do have that, such as the cosmic hunt you mentioned at the start. So yeah, that's, that, that has always puzzled me, why we don't see stories of the stars in Indo-European myth. Because I just think it's an obvious canvas on which to paint stories. Yeah. yeah. Or perhaps but, they use stars to tell them, but we don't have a record of it. But you do talk about it in that in the the uh, wild hunt. The yeah. cosmic hunt is definitely a story yeah. about stars. Yes, that's yeah, yes, so, and, and and we know. So that's a really interesting story. If you want me to yes to tell it. So uh, I'm pretty sure this was De Hoy again. I think he released this in the Scientific American some years ago. He did a study on a hunt story, which basically went that there were some hunters chasing a, a, an animal which had horns or tusks and it captured the sun and it took the sun away and they had to kill the animal to get the sun back. Uh, and it turns out that this story was told in the stars. And we know this because there are still versions of this story told with the stars. Uh, now what's unusual about this is we see this story uh, in Europe, in Asia, uh, in North America and even parts in South America and Indonesia so uh, and even parts actually in North Africa so this story is pretty much all over the world and what is odd is in the northern hemisphere type story we find that the exact same stars are used to tell the story and those stars normally have the same purpose in the story and you like might down think to eat to a specific, specific star, star down to a specific star so this is based on ursa major the, the power. so there was no constellations named at this point no no one in europe knew the constellation was named the same we didn't say that's ursa major anybody in let's say north america said oh well, that's ursa major so we're based on that it's, that story was told with those stars anybody knew to point at those stars to tell the story and so in ursa major there's one star on the handle that um has a tiny star behind it and in the story, that is the pots and pans a man's carrying, or sometimes a spear. But in all the stories, the, and the man, that star represented the man, is carrying something. Yeah. You know, and that's like, you know, to have the same constellation is one thing. To have that's another thing. What is interesting is we also see the animal change in different landscapes. So uh, it be, it's a bear in North America, we often see. So when the bear is killed, its blood sprays over the land and autumn comes and the leaves turn brown. It's a mammoth, for example, of mammoths in Siberia with the version of myth and, and deer and, and elk uh, in uh, Europe. But what was interesting is where the animal dies, everybody was originally puzzled about because Ursa Major is up in the sky. You know, whilst it's a... You know, it moves during the year. It's it's up in the sky. Why? Why do they talk about the animal dying and, and or laying in water at the at the end of its life? And then, as certain astronomy software got better, we were drew the clock back thirty thousand, forty thousand years. And Ursa Major, you see, over time, forty thousand years ago, is actually in the winter drops down to the horizon. It's, and it's like, wow. That's a pretty solid case for uh, at least that myth being understood as sort of natural history, I guess you would mm. and that's you it. Could say. Yeah. And it's very, I mean, I'd love to learn more myths yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, but that, to have that that old that's, that's, yeah. and, and spread that far, that must be one of our oldest myths. And that makes sense because hunting was probably one of our key things to do. Yeah. You know, along with understanding how the year works. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's... Uh, but, but then we also come to um, the idea of, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, how you understand myths and the function of myths. And are they projections of our psyche? Are they uh, sort of a cultural code for a, a norm, uh, <laughs> ethical code for a culture? Are they nat natural history, cultural history? Or all of the above? Um, you probably could draw examples all of the above. What, what I'll say, it seems like the dragon myth, uh, the research done there thinks that we think of dragons being snake-like and serpent-like because there's a natural instinct within us, almost like an archetype, that you could argue that you know, the human eyes are built to see snakes 
even if we're not looking for them. Yeah. You know, we, we, we notice them and danger appears bigger than it normally looks, how the brain works. So there is some thought that um, because snakes are dangerous and we're always dangerous to primates, that's an inherent fear in us. And that's why the snake is has adopted that and we consider it evil. Mm. Um, so you have that inbuilt message in terms of things like the, the cosmic hunt that's a, a message about the, the how why the sun moves around the sky so that's a practical thing but then you have and the creation myth of the Indo-Europeans is a bit different because it talks about the recycling and not well, we know that just doesn't work like that you don't you know killing a person doesn't make that person well, it does make the person go back to the earth, but it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't, you know, you know, make make the, the cosmos grow like that. But that's that's a way of them understanding how to make this world work. So there's yeah. all this, and it's very different to, let's say, the more Near Eastern myths, certainly around the Abrahamic religions, which is very much you know, you worship the god, and the god has created the world for you. And because even before that, we see an earlier like Babylonian mythology the gods had people as slaves and they, they were doing God's bidding. So we see this, well, I'll call it a reflex, you know, the, the same myth, but it changes its the, you know, dynamics to, mm. to, to make people like it. So I, if one religion didn't work, let's turn it on its head and see if people like this one. <laughs> and that's what Christianity did a great example. You, know, you start with this Jewish religion, you know, and, and oh, I, I don't want to you know, injure my penis, okay, you don't, have to, you don't have to sacrifice or you know, get circumcised anymore to join. Excellent. Um, can women and children join? Well, we didn't want that, but oh, okay, yeah, you, women and children can join too. And all of a sudden it's a, yeah, and, and what, do, you know, can we commit sin? Yeah, you can commit sin, but just say, please forgive me just before you die and you'll be forgiven and go to heaven. You know, it's like, it's designed to be a, you know, a, a very good business model of getting people into a club. Uh, okay. well, it's one way of looking at it. Yeah, yes. Well, then there's also the the uh, is there. I'm thinking about it that even ever since I read that book, um, Viking Legacy. You mentioned. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the Vikings, uh, the the Norse culture, basically, of course, was polytheistic. Mm -hmm. Very strong emphasis on what we would call democracy and individual rights. Yes. Private property was very, very basic. And yeah, the right to have your own opinions and to defend that and not just be subjugated to a king. Mm. And I would think when you look at the history, at least in Norway, of changing from that culture to a monotheistic religion and a autocratic king, mm. there's sort of two roads to go here. It appears to me, at least, that you have this or either obey rule or here's a little possibility for you you can do this i can do that and then it's more more um, it depends where the control's coming from i yeah. think so so religion was quite localized so throughout scandinavia some places thor may have been the main god other places fair may have been the main god other places odin may have been the main god there's other gods like ulla we hear about an oath or who may have been main gods. It changed all, all the way through. What happens is the Roman Empire changes its name to the Roman Catholic Church, pretty much. The purpose is the same, though, to to have power. And they basically say, we, we can give you access to our army if you support Christianity and give us a little bit of money back, almost like a mercenaries for hire. That's a harsh mm -hmm. way to call it. But that's almost what like, the Roman Catholic mm. Church did. I mean, look at Charlemagne and... What he did in in the name of Christianity, you know, you know, almost genocide in some parts of, oh, yeah, of yeah, Germany. Yeah. It's a uh, so I feel that's where it changed, where the king realised, ah, oh, people may fight up against me, but if I've got the Roman Catholic Church behind me, with all their armies and power and money, then I can be king. Mm. Well, it seems like there's a different situation in in the polytheistic uh, religion. I mean, like you have in. Uh, I think about the old time in in uh, the Iliad, when mm. they're uh, with Agamemnon being the head of all these kings with their troops. In the, uh, yeah, but he can't just decide what they shall do. They have to have a meeting and come to an agreement yes, yes. upon it. And that seems to be could that be a result then of a polytheistic idea? That's interesting. Culture? That's interesting. I'm not 
sure. I'm not, I couldn't, I need to understand, I need to look into that more. That's yeah. a, it's an interesting question. Does, I, I would, I'd say being closer to nature and, and feeling more at one with the world would allow, I think, for more of that kind of, kind of attitude. To, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not the same idea that they always criticize the, the uh, modern Western culture, just uh, running over nature, not respecting it at all. But isn't that then ultimately coming from this idea of obey because I decide this? Yeah. I mean, if you are in a situation where a god can be in an animal, then this you have some kind of respect before killing that exactly. animal because it might be a god. Exactly, or yeah, it impacts the, the balance of the cosmos. Don't yeah, right. kill things you don't need to kill. Yeah, because you're upsetting the balance of the cosmos. Right. But but then you also see a change over time where, you know, f five thousand years ago we were sacrificing our best bulls, then three thousand years ago we we're sacrificing our best horses because horses became important, and then two thousand years ago. Oh well, we'll sacrifice a goat, you know, and then it, it slowly changes to sacrifice a, a bronze image of a goat or something like that. And you actually see people realizing they're probably not getting value for money in their sacrifices, so they're sacrificing less and less to to the gods. And that's I don't, I don't know if that's people realizing that religion isn't right, or I, I don't know, but I think that's sort of somewhat tied to that understanding that you know, polytheism and linking to nature isn't working in the society that was coming along and forcing us to make those decisions on what we can give to the gods or not. Mm. Yeah, and then we sort of slide into also, uh, or continue in, 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 in with the question of how you understand myths. I mean, you've made a video on uh, Joseph Campbell, mm -hmm. who of course is known for the hero with a thousand faces. There's one story with many variations across the exactly, world. Exactly. And the hero goes out, goes through ad adversarial um, opposition and then wins in the end. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but how do you, what is your position then on understanding myths as, as sort of projections of the human psyche or so. Okay. Like like one example, to, to have a concrete example. I thought about, and maybe this is because I'm thinking as a painter, not as a mythologist. Um, so I have don't have I don't have to be like academically sound in that way, right? Because it's not my craft. Um, when I think about the story of Diana and Aktion, for example, mm -hmm. he is that hunter, has these dogs, uh, speaking of yeah. uh, Indo-European example or image again. Mm -hmm. um, and he happens upon, uh, he goes into this cave and Di Diana with her um, uh, servants are bathing, they're all naked, at least in Titian's painting, which I recommend. <laughs> <laughs> and he sees her and that's a sort of a crime. And then he yeah, is yeah, uh, turned into a stag and yeah. killed by his own, own dogs. So I always thought of that image as a, and of course, this is very much influenced by Campbell also, mm. that a myth is a exaggerated, visually exaggerated uh, illustration of a psychological situation, or at least can be that as well. Because what happens in that view could be that uh, Octayon happens upon something for which he is not mature enough yet. Mm -hmm. He's not ready for it, so it becomes too much, and therefore he is killed or or dies. And mm -hmm. that's, or uh, Campbell has another example with with Jesus. Jesus's death and resurrection is not death and resurrection. It's someone who dies as a let's say a contemporary person and becomes eternal in his mindset. So it's a metaphor for that kind of psychological transition. So what do you think of that approach to, okay. to myths? Or is that I'm? I, I ask because I know yes. you're not very fond of it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not yeah. a great fan of yeah. Campbell when it comes to mythology and this, this archetype and this. Is, and almost some people think it's a Jungian idea of this. You know, your mind's in. You know, there's an inherent instinct in your mind to think certain things and beliefs to create those same stories, those same feelings. Um, and so I don't have that. You know, I'd look at these things academically. I have a, a view on Jesus that, for example. God knew who Jesus was, God knew he could resurrect Jesus, so for God giving his son up to die, he isn't really giving his son up to die because he resurrects him the next day, he could have resurrected him 2,000 years later and yeah. he'd have to say, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, it isn't 
the story doesn't have that sort of philosophical feel to me that that, that underlying. But is that taking it too literal? I mean, if you take this that, literal, that, then it becomes ridiculous. But I, but I have to take there is nothing. Well, I say I, I don't necessarily look at the that type of meaning of myth. I look at myth on why how it's become created, rather than what was the inspiration behind that necessarily right yeah well, yeah you, so you're very clear in your videos about what can we say academically and sort of em empirically. I, I don't want to interpret that myth because it's someone's but, religious because if it is yeah. a myth there is a sacred truth in there yeah. and it's not for me to argue with that religion's sacred truth and what that means but equally you could look at the bible and, and you could get 50 different views on a particular line yeah you know so Whatever I would say may not be right because there'll be so many people. But but oh, when Campbell then talks about, uh, he has that series. That I think it's on YouTube also. The the power the power of myth. Okay. He talks with Bill Moyers, and he talks about, for example, he says that if you're uh, if you're um, sitting and saying, "Oh, I couldn't be a writer," or "I couldn't do that," then he says that's your dragon. Which must be killed. Okay, the psychological aspect of, of yeah, that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is there? Do you see that um, at all? Or well, you know, this you, you see actions of it, such as the the um, coming of age of, of of people in in cultures, such as the young men who have to fight the dragon in the cave before they become a man to fight the real dragon. There's that, but to me, that's just a practical ritual of. That, I mean, there obviously there's some psychology in that because yeah. the boy feels stronger, like he's killed something big, and so he feels like a a man invincible right. and can carry on. And then you throw some summer down his throat and his wherever he is in his mind at that point and can do anything. Yeah. yeah. So well, that's I mean that's self confidence uh, or at least I mean, isn't it the same thing as and again I've been watching so much Campbell so I'm going to to annoy you with that <laughs> where. where <laughs> About, um, uh, and uh, I remember I mentioned this in, during a dinner once, I got so much flack for it because I thought I was, I was seriously saying we should do this ritual. Um, <laughs> where Campbell talks about this, I forget where it is, where the young boys who should be initiated, this confirmation, right, would stand on the line and this, they had this idea of the original man, like the Adam of okay. their mythology. It's in the Power of Myth, that series. And suddenly, from a little cave, that man comes. Of course, it's a member of the tribe. Uh, old man comes out, and he goes out to each one of the little boys, and he knocks out one tooth of each and every one of them. Okay. And then he, uh, this is where I should then emphasize, no, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying you should knock out a tooth of every little boy, but the metaphorical value of this that one thing is and this is my uh, thoughts of it, on it once you've experienced that then later things in life are much less traumatic because you have that that ultimate uh, experience very early on that links you as the camel says back to the prime to the first man and then your whatever you experience in life becomes just really a grand thing, right? Or or becomes lesser compared to that contact that you have back to that original man, for example. So that would be a psychological. Yes, I mean, where where you see, I, I guess what you see, we see is is when ritual is performed to reenact myth. Yeah. You 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 get that feeling. So the the sacrificing of a cow by priests. You know, and, and they're given the best bits to the most important people and the cow goes back to the cosmos. That is enacting that and because you're part of that, that reinforces the belief yeah. in the system. I sort of get that but I don't I don't think there's and I, I understand the experience the boy must go through and understand that psychology. But it's almost like a hero that story's a hero journey, it's so right there. Scared boy, oh my god, my tooth's gonna get out, what am I gonna yeah. do? Uh oh no, it's all right in the end. Yeah, you, know, you live yeah. happily ever after, although without a tooth. Um. Uh, well, well, but, but I mean, um, but, but in that video on Campbell, if I understood you correctly, you're not necessarily saying he's wrong in describing such a uh, development, but that that is not the full it's not the, experience, or or well, more the, 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 the archetypal view of of a human in Norway having. 
the same view of, of well, monster killing is an obvious one because that's almost that that is an instinct. I can see that, yeah. And, and in yeah. South America, if you see two monster killing myths, we can't just say, oh, they're monster killing myths; they must be related. Not, not at all. That is an instinct. But, but I can't necessarily see knocking out a tooth being similar to a young boy coming of age fighting the dragon. Although you you may argue there's a there's an, an initi what is I guess what maybe archetypal is a an initiation of a man a, a young boy to a man yeah that's maybe archetypical you know did you know I want to see my son go up but that is even natural to us so you know, providing you break it down to actually really what's going on then yes so I, you know there are some aspects to Campbell's work I agree with there you know, there's human nature and an instinct so what would you so separate then the the human, because I would think that human beings have a need for ritual, which then perhaps has a stronger psychological component than the myths themselves, or? It reinforces the myth itself, yeah. yes. I mean, myth is just a story and it may sound good and amazing, but if you can reenact it, if you can yeah. fight the dragon, if you can sacrifice the, the human or the, or the cow or rescue the queen or, or whatever, then that works. And that's quite different to, let's say, um, older creation myths where we have the earth diver where the world starts as the sea and 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 land is created and and they're like that doesn't have that yeah, connection yeah. That, that that's lost it so so well that, that seems to be a quite clear case of trying to understand the geology or well, 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 put a cosmogony around yeah, it yeah, which yeah. is okay this, which is what the indo europeans done so there is some Aspect and it's come that because there's a ritual with the myth, so it becomes yeah. that cosmogony. Yeah, yeah, and, and when you have these stories about uh, why this bird is red or why it's black or whatever, I'm not saying that that necessarily has a psychological component because that shows your inner black and white part of the soul, or whatever. I mean, it's it's not obvious that that should have a psychological component mm. uh, to it, mm. but I do think there's, and this is me thinking as a painter. Then when I look at myths or, or uh, then I, yeah, try to see these exaggerated images that can be used to tell a story. In it. Because when you paint, make a painting, obviously you have to make it as condensed as possible. You don't have a series of yes. images afterward. You've, you've got one image yeah. to, to do it. And right. that, that is, that's exactly how studying myth is, though. So it isn't like this is empirical science where we can rewrite the myth 50 times and find the version we like. Yeah, yeah or, or study it. We just have the one version like you, you could and yeah. you like you can only paint the one painting that that is all we have yeah that is yeah That's yeah and there's so many motifs that are strong images like odin with the head of mimir mm. that he he uh, embalms and talks to and gets his answers from yeah. that's uh, and having lost his eye to that which is yeah, right. an unusual right. story yeah and I think that's how you have to think as a painter or maybe a writer or whatever to, to find is what, what um, there's a book on screenwriting called Save the Cat, where it talks yes, about I'm a, I've, I've Blake heard, Snyder, yeah. where it talks about how if the characters are not clear enough, he talks about the, eye, the limp and an eye patch, I think it is. Mm. Suddenly, you you uh, one has always is wearing this hat or in uh, uh, Deer, Hunt, Deer Hunter, Fucking A, it's yeah, just fucking yeah, A yeah. all the time, right? There, there's something that cup of tea, for example. So that that signifies that figure, yes. and that is some kind of a, that that is somehow a visual image of what that uh, figure represents. Right? Yes, yes, I, I totally agree yeah. with that. You, you you build up that character, and that although you know some of these things are odd, like it's odd for me to see you see Odin cut off Emir's head because he isn't a warrior. So you know, you don't, Odin is called a war god, but do you ever see him in battle? Yeah. No, he's not. He's not a Thor. Who's any such a fraud? No. <laughs> yeah. no, he's a priest figure. Yeah. Um, so he, he, yeah. So the, he's a, it's a, the whole Odin saga is again another story. Uh, yeah, yes, but it's, yeah, that's a, you need that almost like an action shot as a painter. I think the yeah. you know, the, the image that captures as much of the the, the myth is happening, the catalyst to the conclusion, almost. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but then we, then we also uh, 
I wanted to talk about something at, at the end, okay. uh, which was made my hair stand on end when I heard that you talked about that in the what's that cosmic hunt uh, video at the Probably end? Probably the creation there. myth. I may have spoken all the death or the religion. Yeah, I the, think the it was the cosmic I hunt. Remember, cosmic hunt. Okay. Yeah, because you talk about the hoy at the end. There. Oh, okay. His research um, that makes sense. Yeah. That's. Well, you can tell what does he say in that paper so, about. So, yes, yeah. so De Hoy in, in his paper uh, as a conclusion saying that uh, he hopes to find one day uh, myths that have come from a different species of hominid. Yeah. Um, because we have some hints you know, that there was ritual and religious belief pre humans uh, and so there must be stories to be told. So are some of our oldest stories, such as the creation myth of the earth, which has the earth dive and the world of being water, um, or other things such as journeys to the underworld, are they part of a, a, a much older set of myths from a different set of, sort of human type species? So, so let's, yeah, we have some examples of this. So, they say what's your evidence we can say well what can we understand any behaviors from our ancestors that we think were ritualistic or, or don't make sense they, they, they were deliberate acts that, that seem out of place um, and we have to be careful here because sometimes when things are found that we don't understand sometimes we label them oh that must be a ritualistic thing yeah. <laughs> uh, but but we came there, there, there's sort of a uh, an idea we have that if we find a buried body, but that body is buried deliberately and positioned deliberately uh, and holding an object, a, a grave good, then we think that person must have well been buried deliberately with that grave good positioned deliberately. And so therefore, the people burying that body must be thinking about what happens to that body after it's dead. Now, you can go to the argument that are they thinking about not, we're not going to be chased by lions looking for bodies? Yeah, <laughs> you know, if they find a dead body, oh, there must be more around. Let's let's go on a hunt. Um, but our thoughts are perhaps they're wondering why has the life gone for that body when the body is still there? Yeah, where's the life in that body gone? So we have preserved the body, and if the life comes back, it. It comes up, or perhaps that body's going somewhere else, and we see an association with caves and with water as being links to another world. And so, what findings do we have to suggest this? Mm. And we see burials of, of humans from, I think, you know, well, pre leaving Africa, we, we see the burials, but and there, there's some uh, burials in Israel we found in caves, but. We're 50-50 on which ones were deliberate or not, or whether the cave fell on people and buried them under rocks. Uh, there's a, there's a, a common thing I hear, which is uh, a mistake saying uh, they, they found pollen next to one body, as though they were buried with flowers. Uh, but what's happened is that uh, gerbils seem to like building nests near dead bodies. Okay. And gerbils have brought materials into the soil. Right, right. And, and we think that's been sort of... Um, yeah, corrupted, the, the, the evidence has been corrupted by gerbils. Yeah. Uh, but then we go back further, and uh, I think it's called Bruquel Caves in France. Uh, there's a, a big cave, and at the back of the cave, there's a small hole, and behind it, another cavern. And in there, they discovered broken stalactites and stalactites, uh, all the same length of the pieces, made in a circle, or a sort of semicircle and another circle, and on these were animal fat candles, candles made of animal fat, like lights, uh, and there's been some burning going on there. And that's, uh, I think it's about 160, 170,000 years old, off the top of my head. So that's Neanderthals. Why are they going into the back of a cave, which has been quite difficult for them, and create this? Yeah. So you think, well, okay, that's, that's odd. But, um, but we can't necessarily associate with a religious practice. It could just be they were bored one day, you know, it's like the equivalent of Lego for Neanderthals, who, know, who knows? Um, but we get a little bit further and then we see uh, some older burials happening and what we call mortuary behaviour. 
And so there was a thing recently about Homer and the Dali on Netflix where yeah. they discovered these Homer and the Dalis and it looked like they had been buried at the back of a cave and made things, but the evidence isn't conclusive, for want of a better word. But we do see at 450,000 years old a number of near, uh, Neanderthal bodies all with the same head injury deliberately placed into a pit. So again, is that putting bodies away in a pit or is that, you know, to stop being eaten by lions or whatever, is that some ritual there? But there, there, there are other burials we see as well, like that where bodies are buried deliberately. Mm. Uh, and so it makes me think, why are people doing that? And to me, if, for a personal opinion, I feel you know, having, having lived life and suffered loss in my life, when someone dies, someone close to you, or I can't imagine losing a child, but watching my, both my parents die, that brings a, you know, a, a strong emotion to you. Uh, and you've got to think, why? And I can't imagine our ancestors were any different, really. Um, and I, I, I honestly feel trying to understand death is probably the birth of religious thought you know think what's done that why i can't see what's done what's done this to that yeah why and there, but there may be other things going on like why does the moon go away and the sun come up but for that to me that's the first tangible evidence we start seeing of humans probably thinking why and to me that's if it's taking that far back they may be a, i don't know how I mean, if the hoy is still doing research, uh, or, or Laquil, his, his, his partner in crime when it comes to his research. If they, if they do find something, I, I don't know how, that would be absolutely amazing, but the evidence suggests there were stories being told that long ago. Right. Well, John White, thank you so much for coming to the Cable Palace. Yeah, no, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Remember, head over to cavopolis.com slash subscribe and become a member today. And I'll see you in another video.